Give us the latest here and give us a sense of how close this was based on what people have predicted going into, into the election yesterday. Well, the, I, I think the polls were showing that, that the expectation was that Ossoff would get between 42 and 46 percent of the vote and getting 48 percent uh, while the uh, I think his, uh, uh, he obviously hoped to get uh, 50 or uh, 50 plus. The 48 percent was a better showing than uh, predicted. Ari, let me ask you about the, the national import of this race. We've had a number of these special elections. There was one uh, in Kansas for the seat vacated by Mike Pompeo, who's gone on to head the CIA. There's this one because of Tom Price leaving uh, to, to head up the Department of Health and Human Services. One coming up in Montana as well. Talk about the attention that's been paid to this and the, and the amount of money that flowed into this race. Well, John Ossoff raised a staggering $8.3 million, and I think it shows that Democrats want a way to fight, pre to fight President Trump and to have a candidate who could be a Republican in a traditionally Republican seat and sort of say, we're, we're here, we're still fighting. That's what John Ossoff represents. That's what um, the candidate in Montana represents. That's what the candidate in Kansas represented. So I think that all of these people are like really drawing in donations from people. They're drawing in um, support from progressive groups who are looking for someone to fundraise for, looking for someone to back. And I think that we're going to see a lot of that now through the rest of the special election season and in 2018. Anita, how has that manifested itself on the ground there uh, in the 6th Congressional District? All of this money pouring in, I imagine perhaps some inundation with, with advertisement, but what, what does that translate to in Georgia? Yeah, there are uh, ads uh, ev everywhere, signs everywhere. Uh, just, you know, this kind of money and this kind of race is uh, completely unprecedented. And it, it's, you know, it's a different kind of race in a lot of ways because the 6th District is not a typical sort of southern uh, 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 district. It's, it's, it's an area where people often describe themselves as being socially liberal and fiscally conservative. So it's going to be a very interesting race to watch going forward. Anita, what can you tell us about the Republican who emerged at the front yesterday? That's Karen Handel. Uh, this was a field of 11 candidates, I believe. Uh, she came out on top. How hard is it going to be for Republicans to unify around her? Well, I think she's got a lot of uh, name recognition, and I, I believe that the Republicans will unify behind her. But where Ossoff has got to get his his people out, the same, you know, he's got to get that 48 percent plus. She's got to get all of her supporters plus all the supporters of the other candidates. And while I do think the the uh, tried and or the, the you know the, the dyed in the wool Republicans will turn out, but those that are more independent uh, will be uh, perhaps. Perhaps a little, a little trickier. Ari, we saw the president weighing in on Twitter principally uh, ahead of this race. I think he said today he'd be willing to go down there and campaign for uh, Karen, on, Karen Handel herself uh, in these coming weeks. What's Washington's involvement going to look like here going forward in the 6th District? I think that um, it really does depend on if President Trump decides that he wants to be active. So far, we've seen him tweeting about these races the week before, but even one attack that was leveled against John Ossoff was that he technically doesn't live in the district, and Trump tweeted yesterday that he just found that out. So that sort of shows you how involved he's been in these races. I think that um, we'll see other um, outside groups really spending a lot, coalescing around a Karen Handel. But as far as what congressional Republicans will do, I think they're sort of looking at what's going on in the ground, wondering what's going to happen in their own districts, in their own supposedly safe seats, to sort of weigh how they, how they act going forward. Anita, we last spoke, I think, before the presidential election. We were talking about the purpling uh, of Georgia or the, the hopes that many Democrats had that they'd be able to make inroads uh, in Georgia in a way that they haven't been able to in, in recent history. Does this race, uh, this race for the House seat in the 6th District, say anything about that, about the Democrats' long-term prospects uh, in Georgia? So looking more micro here than, than at the U.S. writ large. Uh, yeah, definitely. Well, the demographics in Georgia are changing, and the prediction is that by 2018, and certainly by 20, uh, 2020, it will be a very, very different landscape for, um, uh, in, in a much easier state uh, for Democrats to win, and in and, and even smaller uh, races, such as the 6th uh, District. Um, so statewide and, uh, and nationally, I think you're going to see a very different landscape um, uh, going forward.